For most of us, these scientific equations are but hieroglyphics of a strange and unknown tongue. But to the physicist, they are pictures of how the world works, a blueprint of the home we live in. To the man you're about to meet, one of America's most distinguished scientists, this view of the world is very much like the spiritual. Both, he says, stem from the same source, from human aspiration, from deep thinking and feeling, from the depth of the soul. I'm Bill Moyers. Come and meet a man who was born before the turn of the century, who was present at the birth of the nuclear age, and who, although he looks reverently at life in the universe, once told the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, we have an A-bomb, a whole series of them. What more do you want, mermaids? Come and meet I.I. I. Robbie. Keeping with Chevron's tradition of service throughout the 20th century, the people of Chevron bring you this program in support of public television. Young physicists who call on I.I. Robbie are told to take your profession personally, take it as an enlargement of your life, of your insights, not as a job. It must mean something to you personally, in the same sense as art does, or religion. It has to give you not only pleasure, but a meaning to your life. It tells you somehow how much smarter nature is than you, and still you're able to find things out. It's quite a feeling if you take it seriously. No man I know has taken his own advice to heart more steadfastly over a longer time than this Nobel laureate in physics. He was born in 1898 in a small town in what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His parents immigrated to the United States when he was two, and the boy grew up on the Lower East Side of New York City. In 1916, he went to Cornell University on a stipend so meager, he suffered malnutrition while studying electrical engineering and chemistry. He earned his doctorate in physics from Columbia University in New York, and with his wife, then traveled on a fellowship to Europe, where he studied under many of the pioneers in modern physics. Returning to New York in 1929, Robbie began a lifetime career of teaching at Columbia University. In the 30s, Robbie developed a technique to measure with incredible accuracy the magnetic properties of subatomic particles. This won him the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1944, but there was a war going on, and he couldn't make his acceptance speech in Stockholm until 1950. During the war, he took a leave from Columbia to become one of two directors of the radiation laboratory at MIT. There, while recruiting many of the young scientists who played key roles at the lab, he worked on the development of radar and the atomic bomb. He traveled frequently to the secret site near Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the atomic bomb was actually being built under the direction of Robert Oppenheimer. And as one of Oppenheimer's advisors, Robbie witnessed the first nuclear explosion on the 16th of July, 1945. After the war, Robbie became chairman of the physics department at Columbia. And once again, he put together an extraordinary group of professors and students, among them several future Nobel Prize winners. In 1952, he succeeded Oppenheimer as chairman of the General Advisory Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission, where he was a leader in developing the International Conference on Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy. He also served as a member and chairman of the President's Science Advisory Committee. He has been the recipient of many scientific, academic, and humanitarian awards, and has traveled the world to promote cooperation and understanding of the peaceful uses of atomic energy. But his heart has always belonged first to Columbia University, and he lives today just a few blocks from the campus overlooking the Hudson River. That's where I talked to this remarkable man of our century. You were in the New Mexico desert early on the morning of July 16, 1945, when the first nuclear explosion in human history went off. What were you thinking as the last 10 seconds were counting down? I remember asking the man behind me who had been working there, are you excited? He said, no. And then this thing came. What came? Well, what came was something that was 
could hardly be imagined, certainly by somebody who was not a poet. It's a tremendous burst of light, much brighter than sunlight. And that lasted and lasted. One didn't dare to look at the direction of where the explosion was. But then you could. You saw this tremendous fireball with colors in it, very menacing. It grew so big as to be near you. I think I was about 10 miles away. Then I asked him, are you excited? He said, yes. What went through your mind? And first, the success of it, please. And then, the horror of it. The success of it pleased you? Yes. The fact that it had worked? Yes, these were a lot of hard work by my friends and so on. But then you began to understand, almost immediately from my case, that um, it was a different world. And it came to me very hard and suddenly I began to have goose pimples and so goose flesh. You could see it was just the beginning of a power, of a vast power which we had in the control of nature. But it was so much bigger than what had happened before. We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture of the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Do you remember those lines Oppenheimer quoted? Yes, I'm very sorry, he said that. I don't look at it at, at all that way. You don't believe that the scientists who worked on that project and who built that bomb destroyed worlds? No, not at all, no. No, mostly there were good American citizens and uh, worked on this because they wanted to support the United States, support the president. It was a, a real, real adventure. You made this bomb out of materials which hadn't existed in, in nature. It rained 235 plutonium. So this, it was a tremendous achievement. So there was this sense of intellectual excitement, tremendous, of scientific tremendous, pursuit. Tremendous. And a new world, and the power of the intellectual structure that could make it, that could calculate the properties of materials which hadn't existed before. No, to have this occur, was an extraordinary thing, a wonderful thing. And of course, it's inherent in nature. So it was bound to come out unless you destroyed culture and civilization first. Was Just, there a fear that if we didn't get there first, the Nazis would? There was, very much so, on, on the part of some. Certainly on the part of some of the people like Niels Bohr and others who came to work on it, who had such a great respect for the Germans. And they knew some of the German scientists who... Oh, they knew them very well. ...presumably were working on the project. Yes, this was the scientific community, the, the pre-war scientific community, or the pre-Nazi, was a real community. It, uh, one, one knew everybody of importance. So the assumption was they were as good as the scientists working here, and they could probably get there about the same time? The assumption was that on part of some that they were better. Their anti-Semitism particularly lost their best people and the cohesion and the faith in their government. So uh, they really destroyed themselves. This bigotry, this arrogance, this hatred prevented them using the very people who could have that's developed right. this. Yeah, that's right. And of course, this provided a tremendous incentive. For people who work on the project here. Yeah, that's right. There was a really evil empire. It was just evil in every way. And it had to be destroyed. Had to be. Is that why you said once you were desperate to get into World War II? Oh, I was, uh, I, yes, I, uh, I considered uh, the Nazis my personal enemies. You yeah. said that World War II started as an attempt to turn back to the dark reactions against the rational faculty and to introduce a new demonology into the world. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of demonology? Well, they're racist ideas. 
they were going to in time turn the world into slaves and, uh, and uh, Germans. Slaves and masters, and they would be the masters. They would be the masters. And uh, I'm thoroughly convinced that we're doing the right thing. And then you had seen London, which had been destroyed by yeah, the war. Well, yeah, so I could see something. I could imagine that destruction. But the real evil that I saw was there, that they could do it and organize to do it. And they were treating these humans as a mass, trying to herd them the way the Indians used to herd the buffaloes and get them to jump over a precipice. That had to be destroyed. How would our world be different, Dr. Robbie, if the Germans had won? Oh, I don't like to indulge in horror stories. <laughs> Reinhold Niebuhr said in the 40s that the devil was back. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly was. I, there's one thing I'm not sorry about the years I devoted to our war effort. It came right out of the best period of my life when I was going great guns. You had to divert yourself from uh, completely your normal work to war work. War work, and, and single-mindedly. You had achieved distinction before you became a troubleshooter for Oppenheimer. You had achieved distinction for your work in radar. And I've been told that you thought perhaps we could have won the war without the bomb, but without radar, we would have lost it. That's exactly it. Oppenheimer wanted me to be the associate director. And I thought it over and turned it down. I said, I'm very serious about this war. We could lose it with insufficient radar. Why I, was I that? wasn't opposed to the project, my right. own participation. But you felt radar was the more urgent priority. Yeah, absolutely. Why? The Germans, were, for example, were sending in these uh, V-bombs to England. We had developed a radar which could see them coming and direct a fire to shoot them down. Radar, one of the greatest secrets of all time revealed at last. Radar that won the Battle of Britain in 1940 and defeated the Nazi U-boat menace. A radar set uses the principle of the echo to detect enemy targets. High-frequency radio waves are sent out by the radar transmitter. When a wave hits a solid object, a ship or a plane, for instance, it bounces back to its source. From the elapsed time between the transmission of the wave and its return, radar can tell just how far away the object is. Key installations are ringed by radar sets that warn of planes when they are as far away as 100 miles. This amazing weapon penetrates straight to the enemy through fog, clouds, smoke, or pitch darkness. The waves bounce back to the base and a warning blip gives notice of an approaching enemy plane. Radar is so deadly accurate that a searchlight synchronized with it can catch the target plane in the center of its beam while other searchlights form a cross beam. For this plane, radar has charted the end. Our anti-aircraft batteries do the rest. Now, radar as an offensive weapon. Scouting planes spot an enemy cruiser with radar and contact the fleet, which speeds toward its target. At the ship's radio center, radar sets the course to the enemy's exact location and directs and aims the guns with perfect accuracy, though no man aboard has actually seen the target with his own eyes. The scope shows on target, and the guns finish the job. One of the problems I remember that the Navy brought to you was how to knock off Japanese aircraft spying on ships. Uh, and that you were able to help them, and it made a big difference. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Somebody, I won't mention the name, came from Washington, came to us, and uh, came with rather speci technical specifications of black boxes. And I asked him, what are these for in a military way? He looked me straight in the eye and said, we prefer to discuss that in our swivel chairs in Washington. I quote. <laughs> 
Our I swivel didn't. chairs in Washington. Yeah. We don't want to discuss it with you scientists. Exactly. We want to use this as uh, technicians. Well, months pass. They came back again. And I said to them, now look, let's stop kidding. You bring your man who understands aircraft. You bring your man who understands radio. It's before radon term was invented. And, uh, and a man who understands tactics. And we'll sit down and talk about it. So they changed, their, they, they changed their bureaucratic posture. They had to. And of course, it became very clear, too, that we were not in competition. We were there to help them, and we don't want any credit. You once wrote that after about a year at Cambridge, you had almost decided that you'd put in your time at the lab. Then, getting off the train at the South Station in Boston one day, you saw the headlines in the Boston Record. That's right. Do you remember what those headlines said? Pearl Harbor, I was thinking, Pearl Harbor bomb. And what did you think? It was so strange, so outrageous. I still have a vision of 1932 or so, of seeing on the uh, movies of the Japanese bombardment of Shanghai. And these people were fleeing, you know, bombarding their roads. And that finished me with Japan. There they were. They were organized for it. There was no question they were backing their government. They were at war with civilization. Hiroshima, August 5th, 1945, just before the first atomic bomb shattered the thought of the entire world. Then, from out of the skies, Having found the atomic bomb, we have used it. We have used it against those who attack us without warning at Pearl Harbor, against those who have starved and beaten and executed American prisoners of war, against those who have abandoned all pretense of obeying international laws of warfare. Did you approve of Truman's decision to drop the bomb on Hiroshima? Oh, yes. And the, the reasons behind it were very powerful because Europe was starving. We, only people could feed them, we. And we were using up all our shipping in the Pacific to support this tremendous offensive that was going on. The and European we, war was over and we were European war was over. And, uh, and we were concentrating on the Japanese war and we were going to take it. We contemplated a million casualties. But it was the psychology of the American people. I'm not justifying it on a part of military grounds, right. but on part of the existence of this mood, this feeling of the military, and uh, well, they had the backing of the American people, no question. Uh, why not, however, drop it in some uninhabited and desolate place to show the Japanese as a demonstration of what a weapon like this could do? It wouldn't show very much. The report came back. They arranged tremendous pyrotechnics. And who would they send? You mean, uh, who would the Japanese send to watch this demonstration? That's right. And of course, it would take, take time. You'd have to convince them that it really was a bomb, or that sort of thing. Do the images of Hiroshima ever run through your mind now? It runs through my mind in the sense that I might be a part of the show. The next time? Yeah, that image, yes. Someone reported of that Hiroshima explosion that 2,400 nurses, orderlies, and trained first aid workers were at Hiroshima, and 1,800 were made casualties in a single instant. And you said once that this was more striking to you than the total figure of 100,000 people killed and 10 square miles destroyed. Why? It's a destruction of the society. If you destroy it, hit it very hard, it's, it's very fragile. And that's what I think our leadership doesn't understand in our own society, how vulnerable we are. And the loss of all these books and all this learning and these 
fragile threads of civilization that tie us to, just, to the past. Just the ordinary customs that you turn to the right when people coming the other way. This go. Oh, yes. All those things would go. And uh, suddenly become disorganized and we become a mob instead of a society. Once we're a mob, we're not Americans. As a society, we're Americans and have this tremendous tradition. But as a mob, just like any other mob. When I first went into war work in the end of uh, 1940, and began to th think of these things in those terms, I began to realize how fragile the human structure is, how fragile society was. Who would have believed that the Nazis would take root in such a civilized country as Germany? After all, I spent two years there as a, post, as a postdoc, and it was wonderful. And this very short time, this transformation. The Nazis took over. But the Nazis took over, and I must say, with the full support, when people were just turned around. And uh, very frightening, I think something one shouldn't ever forget. Which is? That this could happen to our own country, it could happen almost anywhere. Do you really believe that, that a society with its emphasis on civil liberties, its great tra Jeffersonian tradition, its, uh, its uh, pronounced belief in the dignity of the individual, could, that the seeds of such a thing could grow here? I certainly wouldn't have believed it, if not for the McCarthy phenomenon. The McCarthy phenomenon. Robbie remembers it all these years later as a profound threat to the fabric of American democracy. To understand why his memory of those days is so sharp with anger, it's important to recall the fear and paranoia that Joseph McCarthy provoked in the public life of America in the early 1950s. From his position as a Republican senator from Wisconsin, McCarthy launched a highly publicized campaign against alleged communist infiltrators and sympathizers. The victims of the hysteria provoked by McCarthy included the State Department, the CIA, the Army, and the Department of Defense, and private individuals as well. I am not and never have been a communist. I am not and never have been a fellow traveler. I am not and never have been a supporter of, a member of, or a sympathizer with any organization known to me to be or suspected by me of being controlled or dominated by communists. For one's name even to be mentioned in McCarthy's committee hearings meant the possibility of being fired, blacklisted, or ostracized. His tactics, a reckless accusation amid sensational publicity, created a repressive climate in the country, but he seemed invincible because of his popularity with many voters. But finally, in 1954, when McCarthy took on the Army and nationally televised hearings, millions of Americans were able to see his methods and judge for themselves. At this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? McCarthy quickly lost public support and was formally condemned by the Senate in December of that year. His career was all but over. He died three years later. But the McCarthy phenomenon, as Robbie calls it, had taken its toll. There is a man who had the whole country scared from the president on down. And without doing anything, nobody went to jail much and so on. He just had them psychologically scared. And when that happened, I realized that it's constant vigilance which can preserve our institutions. Fear was rampant. It really was. It, uh, it did scare people, and uh, very few really stood up against it. You did. You went to Washington and testified in behalf of Oppenheimer, who oh, was... Oh, absolutely. Well, I, uh, I always felt I have only one life to live. And I got to live that life according to my own lights. And if we're terminated then, that's that. Didn't you think about the fact that testifying for him would endanger your own reputation? Uh, no, I was so right. Uh, 
No, I, I was just indignant. That they would do this to They would do this, that's right. I was, they'd do this to anybody of that sort. I mean, after all, here's a man who's done so greatly for the United States, and in many ways such a wonderful person. Robbie's generation of scientists was greatly affected by the intellect and leadership of the brilliant but enigmatic Robert Oppenheimer. At Harvard, Oppenheimer had excelled in Greek and Latin, published poetry, and studied Oriental philosophy, all while preparing himself for a career in physics. He was teaching at the University of California at Berkeley and the California Institute of Technology when, in 1943, the government asked him to head the Los Alamos laboratory that developed the first atomic bomb. When the war ended, Oppenheimer became head of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University and served as chairman of the General Advisory Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission. But then, in 1954, at the height of the McCarthy hysteria, he was called before a secret hearing of the Atomic Energy Commission and accused of being a security risk. He was charged with having associated in the 1930s with communists. His own wife and brother had been members of the Communist Party and he was charged with opposing the development of the hydrogen bomb. The hearing finally declared Oppenheimer not guilty of treason, but ruled that he should have no further access to classified data, despite his impeccable record of handling such material during the war. Much of the scientific community came to Oppenheimer's defense, calling his trial a witch hunt. But he returned to Princeton, publicly smeared by the denial of his security clearance. Before Oppenheimer's death in 1967, President Lyndon Johnson, in a ceremony symbolically clearing Oppenheimer's name, presented the scientist with the Fermi Award, the highest honor of the very Atomic Energy Commission that a decade earlier had driven him from the service of his country. That must have seemed like a cruel paradox. Here is the man with whom you'd worked, Robert Oppenheimer, who had helped, who had run the Manhattan Project, developed the atomic yeah. bomb, hauled before the Atomic Energy Commission, accused of being a security risk, and declared to be so. I just don't understand how we did it. It was such a great loss for the United States. He was so well known and got to be well known in the world. He was a wonderful representative of something you don't get frequently, a highly cultivated man. He was forgiven the atomic bomb. Crowds followed him, he's a man of peace. And they destroyed this man. <coughs> we had this conference on the first peaceful use of atomic energy. And Louis Strauss asked me, whom shall we have president of this conference? And I said, I guess we killed Cock Robin. Should have been Oppenheimer. Should have been. Would have been Oppenheimer. But Without you say question. they killed him. Who's they? A small, mean group. Scientists? No. Well, there were scientists amongst them. What did they have against him, in your judgment? Uh, I find it very hard to put myself in their place. One of them might be envy. The other might be personal dislike. And uh, a third, a genuine fear of communism. We can take incidents and magnify it into a situation. Had it ever troubled you that back in his Berkeley days he had uh, fooled around with notions of Marxism? No, not at all. Anybody who didn't at that time was fairly insensitive in these philosophical and, so and uh, social questions. He hadn't done that when he was a child, so he did some of it when he was in, uh, in the early manhood. You mean chaste notions that seemed enticing on first blush. Yes, yeah, so as a child, I was a very young man. He uh, is very much interested in psychoanalysis, things of that sort, and religious questions. He never read a newspaper. Oppenheimer didn't. No, no, that's right, it was beneath him. He was an, an aesthete. Is there any whiff of suspicion all these years later that somehow, either through negligence or naivety or ignorance or will, he was a security risk? I don't think it was a security risk. I do think he walked along the edge of a precipice. What was the precipice? The precipice was, there he was, married to a communist. His wife had been a communist and active. His brother had been a communist. So 
I think there was some poem by Milton about chastity, where you can walk through almost anything. And uh, so he didn't pay enough attention to the out outward symbols. He was sure of his own integrity. This is the earlier period. Of course, after the war, there was no question of his. He was doing very well. And uh, the real question was being a communist. I don't think he was ever dedicated to it. What he may have studied of, a con of uh, communism was uh, in a theory. That was before the war. Before the war, that's right. And after the war, you think there was no, no flirtation, no, whatever, no, with no, any kind of ideology? No, 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 no. no. I won't say any kind of ideology. He still had these mystic feelings about Hindu uh, mysticism. But even though he may have walked this precipice, uh, at the edge of the precipice, at the edge of the precipice, in regard to people he knew who were communists, did you ever doubt his loyalty to the United States? No, I don't think so. I never did. No, it never occurred to me to, to doubt it. He was a he was a very American person of a certain kind. And that kind being? <laughs> no, hmm? no that's a certain kind of intellectual, aesthetic person of the uh, upper middle classes. You once said he couldn't make up his mind whether he wanted to be president of B'nai B'rith or the Knights of Columbus. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, he could have done much better if he'd chosen one or the other. Why couldn't he choose? Well, because he was born to one. And that being a Jew is not a faith, it's a fate. It's the hound of heaven. Is that what you meant when you once said that you understood his problem and that it was a problem of identity? Yes, exactly. When he had left government under a cloud with that shadow that followed him for the rest of his life, was he bitter in his conversations with you? No. And that nothing would have happened if he'd followed my advice. Which was? I told him about the year or two before these hearings, things began. I said, you write an article for the Saturday Evening Post telling the story of your life in connection with this. Put it all down. And be sure you'll be well paid for it. That's very important. And your troubles will be over. Why did you think that? Because I know America how Americans react. Here is something, this great man, he writes an article about himself, his story, for a sad evening post. They're fascinated by it. And uh, somebody comes out with these other things, he said, I've read this in the sad evening post, what are you talking about? So you urged him to just write a, a life testament? That's right, a life testament. And he wouldn't do it? He wouldn't do it. Why? He wasn't, he wasn't as smart as I am. <laughs> What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I, he, I, I'm more in the world. See, I came from Lower East Side, and he came from this upper crust Jewish group that um, hardly believed they were Jewish. Tell me about the world you grew up. You were two years old when your father brought you to this country. My mother. You My father had come beforehand in preparation. Why did he come? Couldn't get a job, couldn't make a living. What kind of work did he do here? Oh, well, almost anything. He had no skills, no training at all. And then he got a job in the, uh, in the clothing industry, and very specialized. He's the man who sewed the uh, sleeves into the armhole. Worked in a sweatshop. Absolutely. And that's what shows me how tremendous the growth in humanity of this country is. In your lifetime? My lifetime. Because there, they're absolutely under the thumb of a foreman. When he was out of work, there was nothing coming in. Nothing. A working man then was in real trouble. This was the Lower East Side in its teeming, congested, impoverished days. Yes, and uh, it's great days in some respect. It was an interesting life as a kid. Heard a lot of talk, a lot of activity around the place, and so on. But, uh, the gangsterism of that time, and the corruption, you knew all about it. What did you learn about democratic politics? Um, around there, uh, 
a guy didn't get two dollars for his vote, he felt the pride, <laughs> robbed. <laughs> now, it, uh, if you survived, it was very good. I recommend it. A real experience. At what age did you start to school? Oh, I, I till, not till late, because I was sick, till about eight. But I had had private instruction in, uh, in religious things. Your family was quite religious. Oh, very, very religious. I mean, they, God was present in almost every paragraph. So what did, what did you read? Bible stories? Bible stories, that's right. And it was part of my survival. I could entertain the other tough kids. I was small for my age. I still am. And um, I could entertain them with Bible stories, things of that sort. That Literally, was... you would tell these no, that's right. toughs in the Lower East Side Bible stories? Oh, sure. They were just tough Jewish boys. <laughs> but you loved telling them, I. Oh, yes, Some of your yes. friends oh, told yeah, me yeah, you were... yeah, they're wonderful stories. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, there are horror stories. Of, uh, of ghosts and demons and so on, you see. See, the family came from the Dracula country near Transylvania. The boy's a kid there, just raise your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the stories in the Bible are stories of great atrocities, oh, vengeance, yes. Oh, yes. inhumanity. <laughs> oh, it's uh, real stuff. These were not namby-pamby people. If you take the Bible as a family history, <laughs> then it begins to have a certain kind of meaning, especially if you're Jewish. And the meaning is? Life. A whole range of human experience. You once said that the New York school system in those days was wonderful in many respects. It took these immigrant boys <laughs> and turned them into Republicans. <laughs> what I meant is not Republicans with a capital R. I meant a Republican in the sense of Jefferson and Hamilton. A belief in? A belief in the, the power of an organized individual group of uh, people taking their own fate in their hands and making a world. This is the first country, successful country, that has been made by men, not by inheritance. The Constitution, everything was made by people. And I'll never forget my respect for the, the Anglo-Saxon race who made this. It's the most astonishing thing when you think of it. There was nothing in history compared to it, and I think our troubles may come when we forget our origins. And those Which, origins are? Rationality, science. Don't forget Benjamin Franklin, one of the greatest scientists ever was. What appeals to you about him? Almost everything. His rationality was one. His wisdom, his tremendous scientific insight, his ability to rise above a situation and see it whole, and so intensely human in the same time. He was a scientist at home in the world. He had uh, every ability. I don't know whether he could sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand you could play a mean uh, Gilbert and Sullivan on a comb. Yes, with, uh, and I was young. You gave that yeah. up? No, I haven't enough breath. It takes a lot of breath to uh, control a comb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry the world has lost that talent. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Your family moved to Brooklyn, and there, you said, you discovered the Brooklyn Public Library. Well, the way we moved to was really way out. There were chickens who were on the street and things of that sort. Entirely different, a complete change of scene. Brooklyn was a country then. I mean, uh, a rural. Well, no, or, that part. It's, yeah. Of course, at home, the only books we had were the prayer books and then school books. And one day I discovered that one of the kids had another kind of book. Where'd you get this? He told me about the library. I went over to the library. As I said, I was small for my age. I mean, registered and I tried to take out a book. I mean, they made me read it. The library? Yeah. <laughs> Stopped you? <laughs> Stopped me. Made me read it out loud to see that I could read. Did reading lead you towards science? In that little Carnegie library they had there, I read almost every book, starting with Alcott, Alger, and so on, Trowbridge. Then came a science show. And the first thing I read was astronomy. And the first I heard 
of the Copernican system. And what's so wonderful there, explaining the phases of the moon, the phases of the planets, the precession of the planets, everything. And was so marvelous, different from the fundamentalist outlook. I ran home and said, look how it is. Who needs God? This is wonderful, beautiful, and I can understand it. So it, it was quite, quite different, made a home for me. And, and I think it would for everybody once they understood it properly. And that it doesn't actually threaten. No, it's your, your home. One of the great tasks of humanity is to understand it, to admire it. To have reverence for it. Have reverence for it. And uh, so to speak, you're, uh, when you're doing science, you're uh, sort of on the trail of the champ. Physics seems to have a great emotional appeal to you. Yes, it, uh, it should have to everybody. I don't know why not. It's uh, really your grasp on reality. So much has changed about the role and the presence in our society of the physicist. You know, in the early part of this century, America was backward in physics. Oh, yes. A young person had to go to Europe. The, the first president of the American Physical Society, uh, speaking in 1900, said he looked back, only referring to not to living people, he looked back for 200 years and found only two names, and one was Benjamin Franklin. That were American. That were American. The other was Joseph Henry. And that was in 1900. 1900, for 200 years. Yeah. Meanwhile, all this great stuff was occurring in Europe. And yet, by 1940, we had enough first-rate scientists to man the laboratories for microwave, radar, mm. atomic energy, and all the rest. That's right. I'm very proud. It's my generation that did most of it. In fact, Jeremy Bernstein has written that the transformation in American physics did not come about by accident. It came about in large measure because a small but influential group of young Americans, including I.I. Right. Robbie, right. came back to this country in the late 1920s determined to make American science respectable. We came with a white man's magic, so to speak, <laughs> which we'd learned abroad. And uh, you see, we had a time bomb here because there were so many colleges and universities that were not first rate or second rate or even some third, not third rate, but they had students. And as soon as you could provide them with leadership, there they were suddenly. And uh, one person can have five students. And four years later, they can take it on. So it just grew exponentially, suddenly. So we could do that in less than 10 years. Why did it happen at that particular time? Uh, some fortunate accidents. And one was the discovery in Europe of a new way of looking at physics, new laws called quantum mechanics. It was very powerful. A wonderful thing, quite different. It, there are a number of facets to it. One is a technique, mathematical technique, which enables one to predict structures of atoms, molecules, things of that sort. And this is what was used, for example, in making the atomic bomb. It changed the whole outlook of the most fundamental uh, concepts. And we came, we were young people, Oppenheim was one of them, and uh, we had this white man's magic. And we got the jobs, and the young people flocked to us. And the white man's magic was knowledge of quantum theory. Quantum theory. Quantum theory. And uh, ways of, not more than that, ways of looking at things. And a whole, a whole research-minded, experimental point of view. And youth. You once said that science should be the foundation for the community of man, but it hasn't been that, has it? Uh, well, it's a very young thing. And uh, there's such various stages of development. There are about a billion people in this world who live more or less in the scientific uh, age, more or less. Europe, the United States, Russia, some of these other countries. There are a billion people in China, quite a different tradition. 
and not, and not the modern. Not that the people aren't capable, but the society. There are another billion people in India. Again, quite different from the others. And then there's the Muslim group extending from the Atlantic Ocean down over to Indonesia. Another billion people. All the other three are really not touched by the scientific tradition. Not that there aren't brilliant people amongst them who uh, do this. So that uh, you see the problem. Mm. You see the immense problem. Does this sort of staggering disparity make you hopeful or fearful? I just take it as a task. I don't take it emotionally hopeful or fearful. The task being? To, to, to do what you can to make it better, to equalize it, you to overcome obstacles of prejudice, of customs, beliefs. Because the scientific thing is the only universal thing. Well, if everybody were trained to see what the scientist sees, what would we see? We'd see a goal for humanity, which is understanding the universe and its infinite variety in which we live. That's such a tremendous goal, we could take a large part of our combined effort just to understand it. But you tried, after the war, you and Robert Oppenheimer helped to develop the Bernard Brook plan, which the United States took to the United Nations. Oh, I'm so proud of that. That there'd be no private ownership and no That's national right. ownership of That's uranium. Right. That's right. Hunter College and the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission comes Bernard M. Baruch. Key figure in two world wars and famed advisor of presidents, the 75-year-old statesman brings his plan for the atomic bomb. Now, with full administration backing, he outlines the position of the United States on the bomb and calls for an international law with teeth in it. We propose this. One manufacturer of atomic bombs shall stop. Two existing bombs shall be disposed of pursuant to the terms of the treaty. <coughs> and three, the authority shall be in possession of full information as to the know-how for the production of atomic knowledge. I mean, that was really rather we are extraordinary. Here. It because was. at that time, we, we wanted to turn the genie over to the world. Whether we really wanted to, I don't know. You don't think it was a genuine proposal? I think it was for a time. But the man who proposed it, I mean, our representative, Bonnie Baruch, certainly didn't believe in it. He presented it in such a way. And when the Russians turned, turned it down, I think that a lot of people there had a sigh of relief. Why do you think the Soviets defeated the plan? I don't know whether they defeated it. They turned it down, which is quite another thing. Suddenly confronted with this by this power, it, against their belief that we would do it. The capitalist power. It, 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 to them, it sounded like a, some trick. I, I'm sure. And then in the summer of 1949, the Russians exploded their first atomic bomb. What did you think when you heard the news? I felt that the inevitable has happened. If you're ahead, you can't stay ahead. You have to figure the other fellow's going to have it. So the opportunity was lost to put the nuclear genie back in to the bottle, so to speak. Forever is a long time, but I think whatever is set up will have to be a, a dynamic process. Just as our liberties are concerned, there has to be eternal vigilance, the price of liberty. The, the same thing for the atomic, atomic bomb, eternal vigilance is the price of uh, survival. And some of my friends and colleagues felt we do this by pressing on to uh, with the hydrogen bomb. What they call the super. The super. 
and uh, in the way that seemed to be natural. But then I talked it over with my friends about this. Um, one of them was uh, President Conant of Harvard. And he summed it up brilliantly. It would just louse up the world even more. When I quote him. The hydrogen bomb word. Hydrogen bomb word. In other words, it might solve something for the time being, but it louse up the world even more. Why did you think that the hydrogen bomb would be more terrible than the atomic bomb? Well, I knew something about it. It's ever so much more powerful by a factor of a thousand. The uh, ordinary atomic bomb was genocidal enough. But this uh, well, really could wipe out a country. The first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. It is almost upon us. H minus five seconds. largest explosion ever set off on the face of the earth. The huge fireball looking like a vast protoplasmic mass. The shock wave races across the water. The fearsome impact of the blast is ready to be revealed. We see the progress stages in the development of the cloud formation. Photographs taken at a height of approximately 12,000 feet, 50 miles from the detonation site. Two minutes after zero hour, the cloud rises to 40,000 feet. Ten minutes later, the cloud stem has pushed upwards about 25 miles deep into the stratosphere. Your generation released this great and terrible genie of nuclear power from the bottle. Can it ever be put back? Yes. If we used it, if we destroy civilization, we can put it right back in the bottle. You once said you wanted to contribute something to the abolition of war, have you? Well, either to the abolition of war or the abolition of humanity. I don't know which it's going to be. Because every time we've made an advance, and tremendous advances, it was only to open more problems, more questions. So this is never finished? No, no. Otherwise, the human race would be finished. From his home in New York City, this has been a conversation with I.I. I. Robbie. I'm Bill Moyers. This program has been brought to you by the people of Chevron, who have been helping to supply America's energy needs throughout the 20th century. Here are some scenes of programs to come on our walk through the 20th century. You see, we were all new to television in those days, and we did not know what a thing we had, what a powerful medium that we were working with. Instead of asking what party will bring prices down, why not ask what party put prices up? Then vote for a change. It was the first time that television had ever been used to try to help a president be elected. When Mr. Khrushchev says our grandchildren will live under communism, we must answer his grandchildren will live in freedom. 
You have to take what the product has and reduce it to a few essentials that are meaningful to them. I ask your help in this campaign for full employment, for a stronger America, for a working America. People say, how can you educate the public about issues with commercials? The fascinating thing is that's not the function of commercials. In politics, you have a one-day sale. You have every customer allowed in the store for one or two minutes on that day. Am I confused? Who am I measuring McGovern against? My gut feeling. My gut feeling. McGovern's hand voted for Kennedy. And you have to sell a majority or plurality of the market or you are out of business. <laughs> <laughs> the political parties are no longer the major communications force in politics. The networks are. You might say the three parties are ABC, NBC, and CBS. It was a decade for heroes and celebrities in sports, in the movies, and in personal accomplishments that caused us to respond with admiration and awe. It was a time of prohibition, speakeasies, and gangsters. And of high fashion. The Roaring Twenties, they were called, and the decade did roar. But it was also a time of hard work for millions and of prejudice against radicals, labor, and blacks. A teacher viewer guide for this series has been developed by Primetime School Television, a nonprofit educational organization. The guide is available upon request from Chevron by writing a walk through the 20th century with Bill Moyers, 742 Bancroft Way, Berkeley, California, 94710. Schools, colleges, and other educational organizations may purchase or rent a video cassette of this program by writing PBS Video, Post Office Box 8092, Washington, D.C., 20024.